welcome the sanctuary. <laughs> I'm not weird, I promise, a little bit. <laughs> My name is Rob. I get to serve on staff here at Sanctuary. It's really a privilege to be a part of this community. And as we were just singing, I was thinking about how true that still is for me. How, how true that still is. As someone that accepted Jesus many years ago, I still need that grace every day. I still need that love every day. I still need a reminder of where I was and look at where God has brought me today because of his grace. Amen. Do I have any witnesses in the building tonight? That's so amazing. Oh man, I'm going <laughs> to... I'm getting emotional already, and I haven't even preached yet. Man, thank you, God. You're good. All right. Man, isn't Jesus amazing? Yeah, he really is. And we're going to talk about how amazing he is a little bit more tonight. We're in week two of this series that we're calling Backwards Gospel. And um, we're going through the book of Galatians, which is found in the New Testament. So this is Jesus has come on earth. Um, at this point, he has died on the cross, but guess what? Spoiler alert, he is resurrected and alive and well, and the church is off and running. And it's a little bit messy, just like ours. It's beautiful. It gives me some courage and hope. When we don't have everything figured out here, um, a couple thousand years post-Jesus, I take comfort in the fact that the people that lived with Jesus, that saw Jesus, that walked with Jesus, they didn't have it all figured out either. So I pray that that gives you a little bit to hope tonight, because man, that's what I'm holding on to right now. The reason why we're calling it Backwards Gospel is for this. So this letter that was co-authored by the Holy Spirit and Paul uh, was written to this church in Galatia. Now, I gave you a ton of background last week. You can check out the sermon online or on uh, podcast whatever venue you like to use to listen to stuff. Um, we, we started it last week, and I gave a ton of background on what was happening. But to sum it up really quick for you in a couple of sentences, we're calling it Backwards Gospel because these people in Galatia, they received a gospel that was completely backwards to what they had initially received. As a matter of fact, Paul said, this is no gospel at all. So the good news, which is another synonym for gospel. Gospel simply means good news. And guess what? It's still good news today, by the way. Um, it's still good news tonight. It's still good news tomorrow. It's good news always. And what these people did, so there were these legalistic uh, Christians that came from uh, what was called a pharisaical or uh, a tight rules uh, Jewish background. They were holding their religious rituals and saying, in order for you to be completely saved, you need to not only place your faith in Jesus, but you have to follow all of these Jewish customs that we, that we followed before knowing Jesus. And Paul's like, wait a second, that's no good news at all. Because according to that, you would need to follow every single law, which none of us have done. None of us have been perfect in God's eyes. Only Jesus has been perfect. He's the only person that has been perfect. He's the only person that will be perfect. And on the cross, what Jesus said is, I'm taking your place. I'm taking your place where we deserved the judgment of God because of our sins, but Jesus took it upon himself so that we can have relationship with Jesus. So just by placing our faith in Jesus, we enter into this relationship, and it is the most amazing thing. So they got that wrong, though, because they believed you needed faith in Jesus and to follow all these Jewish customs and rituals. Now, the other reason why we're calling it Backwards Gospel, which we'll get to later in the series, is when we decide to live our lives and orient and center our lives around the good news of Jesus, our lives look very different. You see, living out the gospel of Jesus is completely backwards to how we see and what we observe today in our world. It's a completely different way of living. And I don't want to get too much into that because, again, we're going to be speaking about that in a few weeks, which just means you're going to need to come back which is fine by me because this is a great place to be every week. It's amazing. So last week, the main point was don't add an asterisk where Jesus put an exclamation point. So Jesus said, it is finished, and that was it. You just need to place your faith in Jesus. They try to add uh, a little bit of a fine print to that. And tonight, we're going to be talking more about Paul 
and about following Jesus, about what the gospel is. And we're going to be talking about tables. It's going to be fun. Let me pray. Jesus, thank you so much again for this opportunity to gather. God, there's nothing normal about this. God, we thank you that your spirit is what binds us together. God, I thank you that although I don't know where each and every person is coming from and coming into tonight, into this room, that you know. God, I thank you that regardless of where we were born or what we previous, previously believed, that we can be one and united, even amongst all our differences, as we look to the similarity of Jesus is our Lord and Savior and our King. God, I pray that tonight... Uh, many people will reorient their lives around you and you alone. We're grateful for you, Lord. You are the reason why we're meeting here. There's no other reason but you, Jesus. So we hand over these next moments completely to you. In your name, amen. So I had an interesting uh, week this week. It was really fun. It be we began the week. We were hosting um, one of our missionary friends. So here at Sanctuary, we get to support uh, World Relief Jordan, and we actually have a team that's going to be going in 12 days, and I, I'm, yeah, it's amazing, and I'm on that team, um, and we were hosting somebody from Jordan at the beginning of the week, and they were just telling us kind of what to expect before we go over there. It was incredible. And then later um, in the week, on Saturday, uh, oh, that was yesterday. Man, it feels like forever ago. Then Saturday, yesterday, my family held a memorial service for my grandmother who passed away a few weeks ago. And I'm so thankful, and I'm speaking on behalf of my entire family. We, so, we are so thankful for your texts and your prayers. And even a few of you came out yesterday as well. We thank you for that. And your love and support means the world to us. So we were at my grandma's memorial service, and I had the pleasure and privilege of actually leading it, um, which is very interesting, doing a memorial service for a family member. But what was so encouraging as I was up there is I had my cousins and my siblings who are here in the building tonight, and, and everyone was able to share different memories of my grandma. Now, for those of you that don't know me, um, my, my family, my grandma is originally from Portugal, so we had a ton of, like, fun, like, because Portuguese, we're like a peculiar people. Um, we, we are, we're, we're, we're really interesting. Um, I'm not just speaking for myself, because I'm American, but um, my, the Portuguese people, they're, they're interesting. The, the house environment is loud. It it's always smells like chorizo or some type of food on the stove. It's delicious. There's always some type of loud conversation about a soccer team because um, Portuguese are crazy about their soccer. And all these different memories were being shared about my grandma. So we had some, um, <laughs> and maybe you might have experienced this with your grandma. We had some where it was like sharing memories of my grandma, like throwing slippers at people when <laughs> they need to be punished. We had uh, other memories of my grandma um, in her home cooking. We had other memories as, of well as well of her in Disney World. There were so many memories that were shared. But the thing that stuck out to me was later on in the service, my mom and my aunt got up and they spoke on behalf of their mom. And there was one thing that really, really stood out to me from the service, and it's what I'm calling the message tonight. My mom said that um, for, for her mom, my grandma, that there was always room at her table that no matter what, there was always room at her table, and that uh, she, she had this table in a small little dining room, an apartment in Bridgeport, but she had like three leaves that she could add on to the table to expand it and make it bigger so that there were always room, there was always room for more people at the table. So I'm calling tonight's message, there's room at the table. There's room at the table. Um, and you know, the, the flip side of this, the flip side of being at a table is not being at it, is being excluded from it. Maybe you've experienced this before. I don't know about you, but I had like an experience in elementary school um, dating way back. And, and maybe this happened more recently too, but I'm too afraid to share about it. But anyway, there was an experience in elementary school 
where I was like in with the cool kids one day, and then the next day, they invited this other kid to sit at the table, and I was like thrown out. I was no longer at the cool kids table. I sat by myself at the table next to them. And here's the worst part. Not only did they kick me out of their table, they pretended like they didn't even know me. And it's like, uh, Peter, are you kidding me? We traded gushers yesterday. <laughs> And now you're going to pretend like you don't even know me? Like, what? It it was so humiliating and heartbreaking. And I'm such a people person. I love people. And there was no worse feeling that I've ever had than feeling separated from people, than feeling separated from a community. And man, that's kind of where our story is taking us tonight. Because you see, in Galatians chapter 2, which we're going to read from in just a couple of seconds. There were these people that came from a Jewish background and people that came from a non-Jewish background. But what they had in common was they both had placed their faith in Jesus at this point. And what we're about to read is these people from a Jewish background turned to these Gentile believers and said, you're not welcome at this table. And, And there's really big importance to all of this. But I will get into that in just a moment. You know what? Let me read. Galatians 2, verses 11 through 16. It's up on the Air Bible, if you didn't bring yours. Here we go. I thought that was funny. Oh, well. Later, when Peter came to Antioch, I had a face-to-face confrontation with him because he was clearly out of line. Here's the situation. Earlier, before certain persons had come from James, Peter regularly ate with the non-Jews. So Peter was friends with these non-Jewish Gentile believers before. But when that conservative group came from Jerusalem, he cautiously pulled back and put as much distance as he could manage between himself and his non-Jewish friends. That's how fearful he was of the conservative Jewish clique that's been pushing the old system of circumcision. Unfortunately, the rest of the Jewish believers in the Antioch church joined in that hypocrisy so that even Barnabas was slept along in the charade. But when I saw that they were not maintaining a steady straight course according to the gospel, I spoke up to Peter in front of them all. If you a Jew, live like a non-Jew when you're not being observed by the watchdogs from Jerusalem, what right do you have to require non-Jews to conform to Jewish customs just to make a favorable impression on your old Jerusalem cronies? We Jews know that we have no advantage of birth over non-Jewish sinners. We know very well that we are not set right with God by rule-keeping, but only through personal faith in Jesus Christ. How do we know? We tried it. And we had the best system of rules the world has ever seen. Convinced that no human being can please God by self-improvement. This is important, church, for 2019. You can't please God just by self, or you can't please God by self-improvement. We believed in Jesus as the Messiah, so that we might be set right before God by trusting in the Messiah, not by trying to be good. This is a powerful message from Paul convicting his brother Peter, who's in the wrong here. You see, what's happening is they're meeting as a church, and they're sharing meals together. And I love it when we get to share meals together after sanctuary, by the way. It is so much fun being able to go out and do that. But man, there is, if there's a weight to sharing meals together today, there was an even greater weight to it back then. You see, when you shared meals together in the Roman Greco culture, it meant I identify with you, I have friendship with you, I want to live like you. I, 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 I see what you're doing. I want to be a part of your life. You are my family. You are my community. It's, it's really amazing. And what's happening here is there's division that was happening in this first church. You see, these Jews, they, they were used to a certain style of worshiping. They were used to certain customs. And these non-Jewish people who place their faith in Jesus, remember, everyone at this point in this story had placed their faith in Jesus, but they worshiped differently. They came from different backgrounds. They dressed differently. 
They didn't look the same. And what Paul is saying here is Jesus, guys, is about expanding mercy, not restrictive religion. In Galatians 2, 12, I'll read it again. It says, earlier before certain persons had come from James, that is the Jews, Peter regularly ate with the non-Jews. But when that conservative group came from Jerusalem, Peter cautiously pulled back and put as much distance as he could between himself and his non-Jewish friends. So Paul, what he ends up doing is he confronts Peter. He confronts Peter. You see, if you don't know Peter, this is the same Peter who was bold in his faith, who was boisterous about it. He was a loud Christian. This is the same Peter that was called as a fisherman to become a fisher of men, to follow Jesus, to drop what he was doing and follow him. This was the same Peter who uh, rebuked Jesus when Jesus said, I had to die on the cross for your sake. And Peter said, no, never Jesus. And this is the same Peter that was bold in all these instances. This is the same Peter who denied Jesus three times in one of the most important Important moments that was happening in Jesus's life. This is the same Peter that after Jesus's resurrection said that he loved Jesus three times and was following him. This is the same Peter who in Acts 10 and 11 received a vision from God that, hey, the way that you worship should not get in the way of my salvation, because although you worship a certain way, my salvation is for anyone who believes. This is that Peter, and he's in the wrong here. So he knew what was right, he knew what was right. But Peter folded under the pressure of legalistic Christians rather than doing what he knew was right, what he experienced, what he saw with his own eyes, what he touched with his own hands. And this was a really big deal. You see, this was more than just bad table manners. This was more than just dishonoring a guest. This was the legalistic Christians saying to the people that didn't worship like them, that didn't look like them, that didn't celebrate the same holidays as them. This was these legalistic Christians saying to these Gentile believers, you're an unbeliever and you're unsaved. You don't belong here. And Paul's like, that's a major issue. This isn't bad table manners. This is bad theology. So Paul has to confront Peter. And we'll get to why in just a moment. But I think it's so important to remember that Peter was at a different table setting. Actually, he was at two major table settings that appear in the gospel. I'll talk about both of them tonight. The first table setting that you should probably remember with me happens in Matthew chapter 9. You see, this is when Jesus, after Peter, he later calls this guy named Matthew to also be one of his disciples. And Matthew was famous for stealing money from people and ripping them off. He did not have a good reputation in the community. So Jesus calls Matthew to be his disciple. How amazing is that? Did you know that one of the most famous nicknames that Jesus ever had was friend of sinners? It's crazy. It's good. And it's hopeful for people like you and me. So Jesus calls Matthew to to be one of his followers. And you know what? He doesn't just call him to step into his life. He actually went a step further and stepped into Matthew's life by doing this. He went to Matthew's house that night and had dinner at his house. And he said, Matthew, bring all your friends. And that's where we pick up in verse 10 in Matthew 9. It says later when Jesus was eating supper at Matthew's house with his close followers, Peter being one of them, remember that. A lot of disreputable characters came and joined in. When the Pharisees saw him keeping this kind of company, they had a fit and lit into Jesus' followers. What kind of example is this from your teacher? Acting cozy with crooks and riffraff. Jesus overhearing shot back. Who needs a doctor? The healthy or the sick? Go figure out what this scripture means. I'm after... I'm after Mercy. not sacrifice. religion. Thank you, Devin. Another translation says sacrifice. Jesus says, I'm here to invite outsiders, not coddle insiders. Peter was at this table. Peter was in this setting. Yet what is he doing now? He turned 
the early church, early Christians, in this, in this act of distancing himself from who were previously outsiders, he goes exactly against what Jesus is saying here. So Paul had to call him out on it. And here's why Paul had to call him out on it. And this is really important for those of us who especially have been in the church for a little bit. Your view of Jesus' grace affects the way others view Jesus' grace. Your view, this is for everybody in this room, your view of Jesus' grace affects others' view of Jesus' grace. They're watching you. Man, you're being watched. And not from a far distance like you might think. You're being watched up close and personally. People are seeing how you treat others. People are seeing how you love yourself. Do you believe that you're loved by God? Do you believe that this grace is for you? Do you believe that this grace is for others as well? Because people are watching the way that you react. And here's what happened in this story. Galatians 2, 13 through 14 says, unfortunately, the rest of the Christian Jews in the Antioch church joined in that hypocrisy. And it says that even Barnabas, Barnabas was Paul's best friend. Barnabas, after Paul, was the biggest advocate for non-Jewish people, for Gentile Christians to come in, to be on the in circle, to realize that grace was way bigger than Jerusalem. And Barnabas, he, he followed Peter's hypocrisy. Why? Because at this time, Peter was probably one of the biggest disciples and apostles in the church. He was the mouthpiece for these people. And here's what Satan does, guys. I, I, I just want to make you aware of his tactics. I don't want to give him power that is unnecessary because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. But here's how the enemy will try to slow you down, slow your purpose down, slow your mission down, and slow what God has given you down. He'll do this. He'll take leaders like you and me, and he'll cause them to stumble. Because if the enemy can attack the leader in the community, the rest will follow suit. And that's what happened here. That's what happened here. Peter went back to his old ways of thinking. Paul's buddy Barnabas followed behind him. These Jewish Christians that were weak in their faith, they followed behind him as well. So I think it's so important that we recognize the power that has been given to us by the Holy Spirit, the influence that we have. You have greater influence than you know. Use it well. You have more viewers than you know. Live well. And I'm encouraged by this as well. Because Paul was so bold in this moment. See, this letter was written before any of Paul's missionary journeys. Paul, at this point in church history, was known more for who he was than who he was becoming. You see, Paul, before he was an apostle for Jesus and a follower of Jesus, he was one of the biggest persecutors of the church. So he had to be bold in his words. And he had to stand up to a guy who, again, he lived with Jesus and he walked with Jesus. He was in Jesus' core posse. And he was, he was like, bro, you're wrong. Bro, you're in the wrong here, and people are following you, and the gospel is at hand. The gospel is for everyone, not just those that worship like you. And this is for us today as well. The gospel is not just for people that worship like you. We are, we are singing some really cool songs up here. I, I love it. I actually, I prefer this style of worship personally. But man, I have people in other churches that worship differently than me. I actually, I love gospel music as well. Uh, I think that gospel music is amazing. It's different. In the 8.30 service here in the mornings, we have people that worship with an organ, and there's a choir, and they worship differently. And what's so beautiful is that all of us have placed our faith in Jesus, so it doesn't matter what style of worship you listen to or what style of worship you vibe with. We're all one under Jesus. Now, here's the question that I've had to ask myself, because if I'm not careful, I could be 
more like Peter in this story. I can get comfortable in my own ways. Oh man, like one of the most common things that I'll hear in the church is, oh man, remember when uh, the church used to be like this or remember back in the day that this happened and, um, and sometimes these conversations happen in front of people that are brand new to the church and, and what those conversations do is it creates greater isolation, greater separation, greater barriers. And instead of saying, remember how it used to be, or man, I, I, I prefer this style of worship. Um, will you worship like me? Will you praise like me? Man, I, I like to raise my hands during worship and get into it. Other people in this room, that might not be their thing. Other people in this room might be even more energetic in their worship than me. But that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is that we keep what's most important to Jesus. So here's how we don't become calloused Christians in a rather calloused world. Remember God's grace for you, and you'll remember it's also for them. Remember the grace that God has shown you, and you'll remember it's also for them. Dan, you could come back up, by the way. Those who have been loved much, love a lot. Those who have been shown a lot of mercy, show a lot of mercy. And I think that it's so important to remember, where did Jesus find you? I know for me, at least, Jesus did not find me. I was not in a great place my whole life. I still mess up every day, but man, when he first found me with his grace, I was not in a great place. I thought that I did committed too many sins, messed up way too many times, was not good enough, not worthy enough for God's love. I needed a whole bunch of grace. I thought that God's grace had run out on me because I knew better. I think about who's at the table. I'm like, would I be one of those legalistic Christians who is putting up barriers between people? Or would I be like the people that were at Matthew's table? I'm just happy to be here. I'm just happy that Jesus chose to eat with me. I'm just happy that Jesus decided to extend his friendship to me. I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't be up here on this stage right now. Don't think that just because I have this, that I belong here by any means. The only way that I belong here is not because of what I've done, but because of what Jesus has done. And I know that if we're all honest in this room, you would say the same. I don't belong to be in these seats. But because of the grace shown to me, man, and it's so good. What I get worried about in 2019, specifically in our Western American culture, is that we've elevated individualism as a value. And I think that there is some value to recognizing that God has a unique love for you. But I think that we're missing out on the fact that God's love is not just for you, it's for everyone that the cross is far too big just for your soul. That the resurrection was far too great of an event for just the people in this room. 